Here we go. And we're back to another outstanding episode of the Square Table Degenerates podcast. Today we are joined by musician, Englishman, or Englishwoman, Sarah Class. How are you today, ma'am? I'm very well, thank you. How are you? I'm doing good. Like we just talked a couple seconds ago, it is freezing here in Cleveland. Uh, it was uh, too bad yesterday, but it snowed a little bit in the overnight. It's uh, We still got a lot of snow on the ground. We probably got half a meter of snow out there over the past week and a half. It's been a lot. Have you been snowed in? Yeah, we were actually, for two days, not, not, not last week, but the week before last, we were totally snowed in. Like it just snowed to the point where we didn't even leave the house. We saw it coming, so we bought like a bunch of food and stuff, and we're ready for it, like frozen pizzas and whatnot. <laughs> Usually I go to the store a couple times a day to get coffee or, you know, food. I didn't, I didn't leave the house for like three days there. It was great. Yeah. It was great. You're probably eating the carpets. <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, you got to you gotta do something or else you're just going to freeze. You don't want to freeze yourself in there. No. <laughs> and you're, so, lucky, you're lucky. All right. Now, your bio says that you're born on the Isle of Wight on a nature preserve. Now, is that true? That's right. Well, I well, I grew up there um, and I was, you know, I moved there when I was very, very young. And, and my dad bought this amazing nature reserve. And we spent a lot of time just, you know, swimming. And it's, it's got a tiny beach. And my dad just, you know, kept it preserved, all these amazing bird life that's, that's endangered. And and we just had a lovely childhood, actually. I have to say that I actually had a lovely childhood. I wasn't beaten as a kid, so I'm quite I'm quite <laughs> relieved about it. <laughs> right. So if you're tuning in for like a childhood trauma story, you're not going to find it over here. I mean, sometimes no. people have a good upbringing. It happens. Other right? traumas. <laughs> <laughs> now, the trauma of the world. Now, how did your dad come to own a park? Or like, what was the situation? Did he own a park? Did you guys like live in the park? Or no. We'd like to have lived there, um, but but because it's because it's run as a nature reserve, you can't get planning permission. Actually, um, my, my father came across the the land when it was really cheap. You, you know, many 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 years ago when it, land was cheap, and um, and then he, because he's a biologist and a nature lover himself, he decided to use it for like teaching the kids because he's a teacher and he'd get them down to look at all the species of and on the land and use it as a nature reserve and help them in the biology. Um, and we were the lucky, you know, we, we were just lucked out as kids being able to be there. And he still keep, keeps it preserved to this day. So I, I guess it will come to us one day. And I mean, we wanted, we wanted to live there. And um, my dad... <laughs> That's a funny story. If you got time, my oh, dad. Yeah, we got all the time in the world. We're here you, to you. Cool. <laughs> so he um, decided to put some um, chicken sheds there because he heard that if it was agricultural, you could probably uh, you could probably live there after you've been farming for a bit. So he got these hundred chickens because he asked the council about how how that would be. So he had these chickens, um, and he was doing very well with the chickens. And he used to play Radio Three, which is our classical station here to one of them and he'd play radio one to the other to see which would lay better. That's a story by the by the by. But the classical the classical hens that have the classical music laid a hell of a lot more eggs. So anybody out there that's got chickens. Um, and then so at the end of it, when he came to sort of see if he could get planning permission, he rang up the council and said, Well, I've been, you know, I've been running this chicken, these chickens for quite a long time. And and they said, Well, Mr. Class, how many chickens do you have? And he he said a hundred, thinking that was like a hundred, you know, that's a lot. And I said, No, no, Mr. you need five thousand chickens. So it's like we could never live there. We never did it. And um, but I think it's good because it means that the land is just preserved as it is and it's still very special and it's a site of scientific interest, special scientific interest. Oh, and in five thousand chickens, I mean, let's be real, chicken coops don't they don't smell too good, man. In five thousand, it you would be that smell would never leave you. Like you'd be traveling on a plane, you would still smell, smell chicken crap all day. It would just exactly. That's probably not very environmentally friendly. A lot of happy, happy foxes, though. <laughs> right, Falkhorn Leghorn's gonna have a field day in your park. <laughs> now, did you come to just come to love the nature and the beauty, the animals and stuff, because of your, you know, being so close to the park, or would you think you would found that anyways, or how did that all come about? It's a very good question. I mean, I think nature's in everybody. I believe that that we're inherently, even if you're a city dweller um you know I, I you get it's what your you know your background does play a massive part you know what you're comfortable with 
Um, but we are, we're born to be connected to nature. We can't escape that. And I think that's the thing we're trying to get back now is that lost connection through everything that's happening with our planet um, and understanding the value of, of, that, of nature itself and, and its role in our lives, you know, whether we like it or not, you know, it's a, it's, it's actually a, a, an economic commodity as well. So it, it's something that we can't do without uh, on every level. So yes, and, I, and that was really, I, I would have loved it anyway, I think, but but I because I'm sensitive, I'm a, an artist, you know, I, I, I make music. So I think if you if you are sensitive to things, then nature is a, a real it's a balm to everybody, but it's it's a lifeline for me, I suppose. And now, uh, what was it growing up? And did you spend all your time growing up on the Isle of Wight? Yeah, uh, yeah, I suppose. Yeah, well, until, until I was eighteen, and I left to go to the mainland, which was very exciting, <laughs> where there's more people and danger, and you know, um, yeah, it was it was my whole life, and you know, my father had a big role to play, really, because he really got me interested in music from an early age, um, and everything was about being on the island and island life really it's, it's it was beautiful it's very hilly my parents still live there very hilly lots of woods lots of sea and you're always relating to the mainland and, and in a way if you're an island girl it kind of stays with you forever so part of me would love to go back i love surfing and things because but there might not be quite enough surf there. i don't know Nice. Yeah, I just saw that uh, if you remember surfing, there's a surfer named Kelly Slater's from California. Yeah, amazing. He won guy. a title back in the '90s, and he would he was in surfing all the time. He just won the surfing championship. Yeah, I saw that. We were watching it. And he's like 49. He's older than we are. It's ridiculous. I love it. I love the fact that I hope he carries on forever because I just you know. He's oh yeah, amazing. amazing. I, love when, I love when people. I'm not saying all right, you know, people who are past their prime, athletic prime, go in there and just still dominate. I really, you know, we got a guy in the states. I mean, football, there's a guy named Tom Brady. I don't know if you follow football, you've even heard the name, but uh, he's like my age. He's 45 years old, 44 years old out there still. And he just retired now, but he was going out there and he was like the oldest guy in the league by like four four years or something. Just going out there, and just killing it. It was great. It was great. Yeah, it's how you. It's your state of mind as well. I mean, you have to keep fit, but you are. You really, you know, if you stay young in your brain and your mind, the whole body will follow. You know, I know it. I know people in athletics are over, you know, are supposed to be over the hill when they're sort of like in their mid thirties, aren't they, or something ridiculous? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. That's not right. That's not right at all. All right, now I looked up the Isle of Wight because I wasn't really too familiar with it, obviously from the states. We don't get the intimate details of uh, English geography, but I saw it's two miles off the south coast of England. And it's known as a popular vacation spot and for hovercrafts. Now, <laughs> we've got to talk about hovercrafts because hovercrafts are totally sweet. I love hovercrafts. Now, were they always there when you were a kid, these hovercrafts, or was it like a time they brought them in? No, they're always there. And I have to say, you know, the land that I'm talking about, I once saw, and this is a, and a crazy, crazy thing. I never realized this, but hovercrafts can go on land. And I, I didn't know that. Um, but they, I saw this hovercraft come straight across all the marshes, up up through the fields and, and it was just crazy that they can go on land as well and there's always been a hovercraft ever since i can remember there very quick to get over there on the hovercraft i think it's like 20 minutes or 15 minutes maybe yeah they um how old were you when you first remember riding a hovercraft probably probably about eight okay okay Did yeah you, ever... you, you need to go and get on this hovercraft don't you Oh, dude, I, I, there was, well, I got I to gotta go way back and tell you, tell you a story. Now, there's this, 1989, there's this video by this rapper named Special Ed, is his name, and it, it, the song was called uh, uh, Go to Church or something. It was just a silly song, but the whole video, he was on a hovercraft. He was like, driving around, rapping on the video in hovercraft. So I saw this hovercraft, and I was like, dude, we got to talk about hovercraft. So now I got to ask you, would you ever consider, you know, doing a concert on a hovercraft or, you know? Yeah, that would be amazing. That'd be sweet. You know, that would be incredible. I mean, they're, they're not that well. I'm just trying to remember how many passengers on this, but I'm wondering whether you could get a mini orchestra on there. As, I mean, you could get a band for sure in the hovercraft. That would be, that would be fantastic. We got to at least film a music video on a hovercraft. Yeah, you playing that, piano for a couple minutes. Band? Oh, that'd be, no, that's killer, man. We got to hook this up. If you're out there, you're from the uh, Isle of Wight Hovercraft Commission. You know, hook this up if you're watching this. We need this needs to happen. That would be great. Now, do you know anyone that has a personal hovercraft, or is it like common to have a hovercraft on the island, or is that just the uh, the commission has those? 
that's a good question that i mean i think that is the next thing to aspire to i mean people have planes but you know that's really last year isn't it that's that's over now i think hovercraft is, is where it's at and if you don't have a private one which and i don't know people that do so you know they it's possible i could i could dig a bit deeper and find out with some of these you know these connections if they've got one but that there's, would be the thing to have now, wouldn't it? That's the bling thing to do. There's got to be a hovercraft channel on YouTube, man. There's got to be one. It's like, I mean, and I, because like in, in Florida, a lot, they got these fan boats. And they, just, you know, they go over the swamp and they have a fan. They just, you can go, go over everything. That's the same concept. But I, I always wondered, like, why hovercrafts, seem, they could probably get over snow. They can get over ice. I don't know yeah. why we don't use hovercrafts more. Really? I mean, they just need very thick rubber underlay, I think, you know, to, to go through those spiky areas. Wouldn't you be worried that the that the bit that lifts up, which must be full of air, or the air's pushing down? It's I don't understand the dynamics of it and the aer aerodynamics. I don't either, actually. And it's been around for such a long time. I know. Like, when you look like, into it, there must be a reason why they don't use them more often. This could be like the video when they first found out the internet. You know, it, we're, we, we collaborated today to, to start a hovercraft nation. It's awesome. I love it. <laughs> you, you, did, you, you did touch on you were a swimmer you like swim when you were earlier so you did you did like swimming i mean is that just part of being on the island we were growing up you just really like swimming were you, uh, you, i mean everybody loves the beach i, I i'm not gonna lie i go like love going to the beach and just hanging out and swimming did that just naturally come up being in your island environment yes yes i love swimming i'm obsessed with it i used to go in any kind of cold water i could um and yeah, I generally rarely wear a wetsuit. It's not quite the same, but I just, I really love it. And and just swam from an early age. I, and then surfing has been a, an extension of that. So, what, I mean, where I live in Bristol, it's not kind of, we're not that far from Devon and Cornwall, which are the West Country, which do have massive waves, by the way. Talking about Kelly Slater, he, he might be impressed with some of them. Not as good as like Portugal or Hawaii, but you know. Portugal's awesome. You ever been to Portugal? I love Portugal. And, yeah, uh, it's really lovely. I was down yeah. on the, the south coast of Portugal. It was by, like it was mainly Spain, but we went over to Portugal too. It was a town called Lagos. And there's mm. all these uh, little inlets in, uh, I don't know, I can't remember what they were called, uh, grottos and stuff. Oh, that was beautiful, man. Oh, were you there? It was 2006. I was there. I was in the Air Guard. I was in the Air Force, and uh, we were there. I was in stationed at a place called Marone Air Force, Marone Air Base, Spain, which is like right outside Sevilla, Spain. Yeah, I went to Seville. That's amazing. Oh, Seville's awesome. I love Seville because it's like it's so old school. Like we had this tiny, real rental car, was real small, and the alleys were like so small. Like we were driving and whatnot. But yeah. you just park, just walk, and oh, I love that whole vibe there. I've said Seville's a great town. We went to all those coastal towns too, like Malaga and. Yeah, and all that. Oh, I thought the Mediterranean coast is beautiful. It was hot though; it was really hot. Yeah. Man. It was so hot over there, especially if you're from uh, from Ohio. Oh yeah, the hottest we get. I mean, we, in the summer we can make it 80, 90s, but like you know, for six, seven months of the year, it's cold as hell. I mean, it's it's so cold some days. It gets negative negative degrees in Fahrenheit, which is like negative twenty or something in Celsius. It's ridiculous. Oh uh, well, I miss hot weather. I used to go to LA quite a lot, and I I still will, but I you know I haven't traveled as much recently. But I just love. I just love that bright Californian sunshine. And I love Greece. That's my favorite place. That's my happy place. I've never been to Greece. Never, never to Greece. I'd love to oh. go out there. I don't know if I'll get to it at this point. And I might, who knows, if we uh, get some more yeah. money in the travel budget. With, with kids, it's hard to get you know get people motivated to you know go to a random place like Greece. I mean, for every Greece, there's four <laughs> places here I haven't visited yet with the kids. So it's like, we'll see. We'll see. It might be cool. It's now, great. Uh, we had a question uh, from the chat here. Hold on. Uh, bear with me. Somebody said about your musical inspiration. How can I not find this? Oh, here we go. It says, what are Sarah's musical inspirations? Oh, thank you, Jamie. Um, well, my musical inspirations, believe it or not, are, I, I like a lot of the really melodic, uh, the melodic artists um, and writers, people like um, Nick Drake, John Lennon, James Taylor, Simon and Garfunkel, Art Garfunkel, uh, Paul Simon, sorry, particularly. Oh, I love Simon Garfunkel. I just love all of that. Um, they're all really inspiring, I, but but uh, but mainly a lot of classical music because I'm I'm just I love Mozart. I really love as a as a composer called Leos Janáček. You know, all of course not with us anymore, but just their music is timeless. I just love it, and I, I grew up on a lot of jazz because I was really into that. And um, 
yeah, I, I love all sorts of music, really. Good music, whatever, whatever genre and whatever moves you. Thank you. Now, did you, we'll go back to the island here. Did you ever know anyone who's tried to swim from the mainland to the island and back? Or have you tried it yourself and could it be done? It has been done. Um, a few times people have swum the channel. Yes, it's it's a thing. I think they cover themselves in, in goose fat and get in the water. And <laughs> I mean, I don't know. I just cover myself in goose fat for the hell of it. <laughs> but no, I, I, um, I've never tried it. I've thought about it, but it's actually, I, I can't remember how many miles. I think it's about five miles or maybe more. Maybe it's more in certain places. You'd have to be in peak shape to bust out a five-mile swim, man. I, I could probably go 100 yards, maybe. I, I know I could do a swimming pool. I can see a floating whole swimming pool in a standard Olympic size swim pool is about 50 yards. So I, I don't know, 40, 42 meters or so. But so, I mean, that, that long would be, that'd be a hell of a swim. That'd be a hell of a swim. Mm -hmm. miles. I'd have to, I'd probably have to train for months or years on end. I don't know if I could even do it at my age. Oh, uh, you could. You're not old, for goodness sake. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. You never know. <clears throat> now, what got you into the piano when you were young? Was it just there was a piano there and it was just the, the thing you do? Or what, uh, what your influences for the piano? Why did you pick that instrument? Uh, well, I, I would say attribute that to my dad again, because there was a piano. It was a baby grand piano in the in the house. And my dad loved playing. Um, and he got me on the piano when I was really young, about four, and just would get me to play. I mean, I, I loved noodling around on the piano anyway, making up little tunes and always wishing I was good as what as Mozart, but not writing concertos at that age. But <laughs> I can remember some of them and singing along to myself. But yeah, that's that's. Um, my dad and then he got me with a, a teacher quite scary strict lady teacher at the age of about eight um yeah <laughs> she used to wrap my knuckles with a with a, a ruler when uh, she didn't like what i was playing <laughs> oh she so had a, a typical uh mary poppins old school uh strict yeah. nanny, or strict uh nanny like don't do that Tara, don't I do know. that <laughs> i loved her in the end but at the time i was scared you know don't make me go back now, did you want to, or did you, can you play any other instruments or did you try playing any other instruments when you were coming up? Yeah, I, I played clarinet for a bit because my dad, again, had that in the house. But but really, I learned the guitar about 15 years ago, maybe now. Um, 20, yeah, 15 years ago. So just because I just thought it'd be easier to carry a guitar if I was going to play, you know, on stage. Because I started off doing a lot of Americana folk stuff, which I really love doing, as well as all the writing music for TV and um, all that kind of stuff because uh, I think you have to turn your hand to any kind of music. So I would have to learn about instruments. Tried to play violin for a bit, but that needed too much more commitment. And then singing as well. I learned that later. Um, so yeah, I'm doing a, a dabble a bit in things, but guitar, piano, my main thing. I'm feeling the most comfortable at. I'd, I guess I'd say. Okay. How old were you when you first started playing in front of other people? Like, and not competitively, I mean, just, you know, say, hey, here's Sarah in a concert. How old were you when that first happened? Um, well, I had to do, I had to do concerts and things, um, festivals when I was, well, as early as I can remember, was probably about 10. Um, kind of, so quite scary, you know, when we're forced to do that, uh, to do, to do this kind of competing in festivals and, uh, I didn't really like it very much, but I'd always like shake like anything. And I wish people had kind of taught me meditation then, cause that's what I do now. It's brilliant for, for life, a life skill, but, um, yeah, performing it's, it's, it was good, good practice though. And good discipline. Oh yeah. When you're, when you're a little kid like that, I mean, we're, when we're adults, you know, we could, you know, you could have a couple of drinks, you could smoke a little bit, you could do whatever to calm your nerves. When you're a little kid, they just throw you out there and be like, Oh yeah, here's all your, you know, felt relatives and sing and do whatever. And you're just like, you're freezing. I remember, you know, choral concerts and stuff at Christmas. Oh, you just, oh, I hated those when you were little. Well, when, when I'm an adult, I love, I love being in front of a crowd. Now when I was young, I hated that when I was younger, uh, was, cause you're so shy and you, you know, you, you're thinking everybody's looking at you, but they're really not. You can just do whatever. And they're going to, you're a kid. You're going to cheer for you. Boy, yeah. it's, it's so nerve wracking. They're going to play. Yeah. They're going to they're going to clap you anyway because because they feel sorry for you anyway. <laughs> but did you? What was your instrument? What did oh, you I never played any instruments. I just uh, I'm just, I'm just all like like younger when I would be singing or something yeah. in a choral concert like at school when I was like seven, you know, stuff like that. You've probably got a natural aptitude being doing what you do. I would have probably we when we moved, bought this house in '09, there was an older piano in the basement, but like half the keys were busted. I mean, they weren't like busted. But you had to like really press down on the key to work it. So, I mean, I, I learned a little bit of it. Like, I learned how to play the Simpsons theme on it. And, you know, maybe uh, 
like the NBC chime theme and stuff like that. But I mean, it was just yeah. me. I didn't, I didn't learn the music notes and all that. And we ended up getting rid of the piano just because it was, uh, it was it, that part of the basement kind of flooded and there was a lot of rust over there. So oh, it was like, not yeah. and I, I, bought, I ended up buying a keyboard later, but uh, it's like, I don't know, maybe later once I uh, get back into it, I could learn some keyboard notes or something, but no. Yeah. So you can always learn new skills no matter how old you are. You can be a hundred years old and learn the piano. I mean, it's no, uh, it's no yeah. It's, it's never too late to start learning an instrument. No. Now, this I Love Right Music Festival. Now, I saw there was a huge one in 1970. Now, does this thing still go on? Um, I- well, funnily enough, there was there was something that's called Bestival, um, which was going for quite a long time. And I played that actually once a few years ago. It was great. Um, but they've just stopped it. And they, yeah, we didn't, we've, I think this, the Isle of Wight Festival, the famous one that, was that 71, 72? Have I got yeah, that right? Early 70s, I think 1970 maybe. Yeah, 70. And uh, there was, I think there was one in 68 as well. Or, um, but anyway, it was it was after that because a lot of, there was a lot of, you know, damage to people's properties and, and they decided they'd stop it and not have, you know, uh, I didn't think, I didn't think that situation. They used to do, like Woodstock was like that. Like they, uh, yeah, Woodstock, yeah. <laughs> there's, a, there's a documentary. If you ever seen Woodstock 99, it was uh, the 30th anniversary and they were trying to like do it, but it was all, all corporate America and the worst of corporate America going into it. Like they didn't have enough bathrooms, they didn't have security. Oh, no. uh, was, if you ever get a chance, uh, not just a huge 99. Yeah, so, it's, on each, it's on HBO Max. There's a documentary called Woodstock 99. Oh, it's great. It's so great. It's, I'll have it's, to see it. I, I mean, so when did they stop Woodstock, at the actual? Well, they only did. They did the original one in 69 up there in uh, New York. All of them have been in New York. And then in 94, they did one uh, for the 25th anniversary. And then they tried to do another one in, for the 30th anniversary. And that one was such a flop in terms of, you know, the just the reception. I mean, they, they got up. They just never staffed it. They were charging eight dollars for bottles of water. Then they had bathrooms, all the toilets overflowed. They had no place to camp. Uh, and, uh, all the septic tanks backed up. People were oh, it was so disgusting. But so after that, they kind of stopped it. They were supposed to do a fiftieth one in twenty nineteen, but it was so corrupt that they just dropped it. I and mean, that's how uh, the music industry here in the states is just so bad. It's just that's so not right, is it? It shouldn't be like that. No, nah, music should be from the people. It should be from the heart. And you got all these corrupting influences out there on it, and money got into it. It's just it's so bad now. Uh, it's ridiculous in America how it is. Uh, it's, it's a shame. Well, maybe somebody can, you know, get together and get a, a, a good sort of team of people to do another a proper Woodstock. We've oh, got yeah. Glastonbury still here. We've got, you know, that's massive. I've never played Glastonbury. I've always wanted to actually do it. I don't want to go to, I'd rather, I'm not really a big crowds person, so I'd rather sort of be, you know, flown in on a helicopter. I'm the same way. I don't mind the crowds per se, but I don't want to be, you know, 50 rows back and 80 rows that way. And, you know, oh, there's a 20 minute walk to the bathroom. And I just, like, yeah, it's it's all the crowds of, you know, the the 50, 50 long, you know, queue to the to the toilets and that kind of thing. I, I don't mind the camping and it's lovely, but I, I don't like having to walk with loads of ca- with music gear for, for miles because th- you do have to do that sometimes. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And I like I like just sitting down and relaxing when I'm watching the show. Like we have uh there's a place in, up in Cleveland, there's a concert venue about half an hour, 45 minutes south called Blossom Music Center. It's like they have a pavilion. <clears throat> it's an outdoor, you know, center thing. They only show concerts in the summer, obviously, because it's so cold. But, like, you can get pavilion seats. Or if you want to, you know, get a blanket, you can sit up in the, you know, the, the lawn, they call it. And yeah. watch the shows from there. And that's, I like that kind of thing because it's not too crowded. But because I've been to other shows, you know, there was this place called, this thing called Rover Fest. There's a local musician or local uh, radio guy. His name's Rover, so he had a bunch of content. It was fun. I mean, you're just standing there, and like, if you move, you lose your, lose your spot, and it's like, ah, it's a little bit uh, Hey, Bill, I was going to ask you, actually, Joe, do, do you know a band called Oingo Boingo? I've heard of them. It, uh, well, I think they might be from Ohio. I might be wrong, but I, I just thought, because uh, a friend of mine, he played keyboards in them, and he was from Ohio, uh, Richard Gibbs. Don't know if you've heard of him. I'll have to look them up here. He's, he's a composer. He's a well-known composer in Hollywood now. But okay. he, he's done lots of things like Big Mama's House. And, and Danny Elfman played in the band. Danny Elfman was... Danny Elfman's from the... He did the Simpsons one, didn't he? The Simpsons soundtrack. Yeah. Hmm. Okay. Yeah, the only old boy girl also known as Clowns of Death, Mosley and the B-Man. Okay. Nice. I mean, yeah. I think they're from Ohio. I might be wrong. But I know he is. But I just thought he, you might know them. Oh, nice, nice. Not, I don't think they're going anymore. <laughs> no, All right, okay. Another question from Jamie says, "What? Is, where's the most memorable place you have played?" Memorable place? Oh, that's a really good question. 
Um, mm, 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 good question. Well, I have played on a boat in Paris. That was really beautiful. That I was, it was traveling down the river, and it was, it was actually with a. Was, I was singing, um, and it was with a, a, a whole a whole group of you guys from um, from California. Oh, and uh, nice. that was really good fun. I'd say that probably was a memorable gig. Nice. I've never been to Paris. I've never been to France either. I uh, wouldn't mind visiting. I don't know. It's uh, it's another one of those things. It's like, you know, when I talk to people from England, they're like, oh, if you come over here, man, you can't just visit. You get you screw them. They go to other places. So it's like, it's like uh, people like that from the States, too, when you talk about New York. They're like, oh, if you come to the States, you can't go to New York. But, I mean, there's cool places in New York and in London. I mean, it's uh, you're not going to. If I'm going to go to England, I'm not going to not not visit London. I'm not going to spend the whole time there. I mean, there's so many. Mm. The more you look into the country, I mean, there's, there's oh, so many okay. places. You could spend three weeks over there in England. Yeah. London is time, just a big city. I and mean, it's an amazing city. But I, I would go to the Lake District and Scotland and, and you know, the West Country. It's just it's beautiful. But oh, if, you're, if you're over here, you may as well visit Paris. Oh, yeah, that's true. That's true. I've never been there. I mean, I, I went, I've been to Ireland. I went to Ireland in 99. Me and my dad visited. So I, I'm familiar with, like, a lot of the coast and stuff. Like, really? uh, the Ring okay. of Kerry was amazing over there in the on the coast of Ireland. And I oh. saw some, when I was looking up the Isle of Wight, I saw some of the pictures, and it looked just like the Ring of Kerry uh, from Ireland. It reminded me a lot of it. So that was really cool looking. Really fun stuff, man. It's really cool. I, I love it so much. I just put, I just done a video. Um, it's called Blackbird, and I put the Isle of Wight in it, um, just the beginning and the end, because it's well, it's all about child, childhood on the Isle of Wight and hearing all the beautiful birds there, and uh, and it's yeah, it's that whole a special thing with having the water in between. I don't know. There's so many places like that. I think that's why I love islands like the Greek islands and things, and that whole thing in Europe. Oh yeah. Now, what this uh, this film, The Weekend, you wrote the soundtrack to. Now, how did you come about that? And was that your first like kind of big experience in music industry? I mean, at least the yeah. you know commercial side of it. I think that was my first. Um, that's my first feature film. Um, before that, I'd, I'd done quite a few animal films, you know, natural history films, um, and so there were commercial. But this this one, I, I was always trying to get. You know to do more features uh, movies and so this is quite a big thing for me and it's a composer called dan jones who's a really great composer and good friend and uh, they needed i think they needed to write the score in 10 days because they didn't have <laughs> they didn't i don't know what the budget was probably it was rubbish and um they needed to do it quickly and so they got me on board the the um, agent got me on board as well we ended up doing the weekend and um yeah it was it was with Gina Rowlands and Brooke Shields, um, and it, yeah, it was a great, it was a, it was a nice little film and, and a great experience. Quite, oh, I, I didn't like the staying up till three in the morning mixing. That was that was quite exciting. Oh, mixing, I'm, I'm the same way with video editing. That's why I do live shows because, like, I mean, I, could I record you and then you know edit it and cut out and this and that and graphics? I could, but I mean, at the end of the day, it's more fun, you know, doing this live because you got interactions. And I, you know, the older you get, the less you want to edit. That's the way I look at it. You know. Yes. I, it's, not, it's looking at the screen for so long. I mean, I, I'm, yeah, it's the same. I write writing on a, do you know Logic, the program Logic? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, oh, yeah. yeah. so I do do a lot of stuff on that. And after a while, you just think, I've got to get a, have a walk. <laughs> I've got to, got to take a break. Oh, yeah. All right. Now, write, writing classical music, how, how does that come about? Like, I know with, like, say, rap music, I mean, they just sample other music and, you know, put words to it. Like, scores and all that, do you just, like, get a melody in your head? Do you... Just stare out of space and like, okay, there's a tree. Uh, let me, you know, get a riff there. How does how does how do you even write uh, classical music? Well, uh, it it depends what it is. If it's if it's like, um, do you mean for for score scoring for TV and film? Or right, right. Like, like 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 the like say example the, the Star Wars or uh, you know da, yeah. da, da, da. how would you, how would you even get the inspiration for something? Like, you got to listen to other music and kind of pull in notes here or there. I mean, how does it even come about? Does well. I think what happens is, well, for me, and I think anybody, um, you know, if you're doing dance or painting, it's a similar process in in it, that it kind of, uh, it kind of comes through you, ch channels through you. So you, so for me, it depends. It's in different ways. I uh, I would just get a, a song come into my, a, a theme, a melody come into my head. I could hear it, you know, hear the whole melody, and then I will. Um, right and then i'll get it down really quickly now I, I will often hear the bass and i'll hear you know the other mid stuff and all the sort of maybe drums as well 
and, and rhythm as well at the same time. So I might get an idea, like a, a kind of rhythm will come into my head. Depends. I mean, if you've got, for example, if you're doing music to a film, um, very often the director will have a, might have an idea of the kind of thing he wants, but you have to ascertain from that whether it's what, what they've already got. Sometimes they already have music there just to fill it in for the editor to cut to. Um, and uh, you look at that piece of music and you think, well, do I like that? Does that work? You might start completely from scratch. But say if it's um, a drama, for example, and you've got a really tense sequence with a lot of emotion going, you might, you know, for me, that might just say, oh, I really need some edgy strings here or um, something, maybe some piano that's kind of taking some other bit, uh, emotions that's a bit, uh, I don't know, because you can layer up all these different things um, in drums, some low beats, who knows? I mean, it just depends on what on what you feel and, and what the scene is saying to you. I mean, for me, if it's writing music for, uh, like I've just written this piece called Resonate on the album, Resonate, and it's about... It, it was about endangered land and about you know the environment going and for me that's a big passionate um situation that i feel very strongly about so i've i get very emotional about that um uh and so especially at the time my dad wasn't very well so that helped to, to get that all out um he's better now i'm really glad to say but i i wrote from my heart and it all poured out of me i just this solo cello is a very emotive instrument and that came to me a theme happened so I kind of think it's a bit of a divine inspiration really that's how it happens a lot of people say they'll write the music and they won't know where it's come from and you go back and listen when, once I've all recorded it and think how did I write that because you know um the instances where you would maybe refer to another piece of music is like if the director says I really want I want something like Star Wars <laughs> then I might go okay I'll go to Star Wars and just see what it is about Star Wars he loves. Uh, is it that beat? You know, is it that kind of thing? Uh, Holt's Planets, that, you know, da -da -da -dun 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 -dun, that kind of thing. It's very Hans Zimmer. Um, very Holt's Planets, very Hans Zimmer, very, you know, every, everyone's got a kind of style. So, yeah, you you do kind of soak things up. But I don't like to listen too much to other other things because I like to listen, let it sort of assimilate into my body and then see what comes out because then you get something fresh and different. Oh yeah. oh yeah, I'm the same way with comedy. I'm a stand-up comic by nature, and like, Are you? I couldn't. Uh, yeah, it, it's been a couple years since I've done a mic. I really got to get back out there. But we did really? a show right before the pandemic. It was the first show I produced. It was like uh, February 29th, 2020. And then we had a second one scheduled. And obviously, everything canceled. And I just that's when I transitioned into YouTube and you know, talking to interviews and stuff like that. I mean, I was still I was I already had the show, but originally it was just called square table degenerates because we have a square table and four guys were sitting around talking about it on the table but we had to go virtual once it went and so it kind of led to that and, and different things have changed since then because like some of the guys got different jobs one guy had a kid so not everybody can come to every show and we're trying to expand it you know different new different time slots and whatnot but yeah, yeah. I, I totally feel that now when you're when you got that music and do you sometimes have to watch the you know the movie first do they give you like okay here's the footage and then yeah. you, you get the footage based on that, or you never have to work backwards. Like, okay, give us some music, and then we're going to find some nature, right? It's always the, they give you the footage, yeah. and then you write the music after that? Usually that. It's usually that. Only once did I have to write a whole load of music to a script, which was interesting. And they, they yeah, I gave them the music. Uh, I think it was because of their editing schedule, and uh, it worked the other way around. And then I had to kind of, they put it in after I'd written. I'd re read what the script said, and then, they would work it like that but usually you sit with the director or producer and just go through each section and see what they love about it do they want like metallica mixed with i don't know chick career and a bit of you know uh, beethoven or do they want you with um whatever you like sky's the limit so that's how you do it and you sit with them and then and you go through that i'm, I'm going to do that this week actually i've got um i'm doing a national geographic series coming up um and based in america I, it's I'm writing it here, but it's all about America. And um, okay, so what, let's look, before we get into Weed Wars question here, what what the, what's the American uh, thing you're gonna do? Is it a nature based? Uh... Yes, I'm not sure if I'm allowed to say too much about it, but let's just say it's it's based in America and it's all it's nature based. Yeah, it's okay. all about natural okay. history. Definitely. So you're gonna love it. I'll tell you when that comes out. All right, sweet. All right, we got a question from Weed Wars. He says, "Have you ever heard of the guitar player composer Steve Vai? You should work with him. It would be some amazing music." 
Oh, I'd love to work with Steve Vai. Uh, absolutely, I love him. I, I think he's incredible. Uh, I, I, you know, I'm actually, a, I, I'm in my head, I'm a secret guitar whittler. <laughs> I, I, I'd love to be able to do all that tapping and that stuff. I just, uh, Steve Vai and Joe Satriani and, you know, Frank Gambale. Uh, I love all of that. I love that guitar playing. And, you know, and, and do you know, do you know a guy called Jason Becker? Jason Becker. Jamie C. Do you know Jason Becker? If not, check him out. Unfortunately, he had a very sad disease. Um, and he, but in his teens, I think he actually, I think he played with, Dave Lee Roth, I might be wrong, but he he's an incredible, incredible guitarist and composer as well. Uh, nice. We got another question from Jamie. He writes, is there anything that you haven't accomplished that you would still like to? Um, yes, I'd love to. Uh, I think I'd love to do some massive classical performances, you know, something like playing at the Albert Hall. That would be uh, amazing to do. Um, uh I think I'd, I'd love to do a, like a really big movie, a really big emotive Hollywood movie. I've done a few few films, but something that stays with you forever. I mean, I don't know, you know, like like The English Patient or, you know, some of these big sort of epic, beautiful movies, something something in that vein, you know. Heck yeah. All right. Um, now, do you have any... Non class, you touched on a little bit of this earlier. We talk about Lennon and like Garfunkel and all that, but any major people would think, you know, okay, this is kind of a weird inspiration for you, like any rap or country or anything like that. Inspirations that are just kind of music do you like listening to that people wouldn't think that you would normally like? No, well, that's a really good, that's a really good question because there's so many, there's so many interesting performers out there. Um, I wouldn't normally like. Um, I mean, there's a lot of sing singers. Um, I mean, it'd be. I mean, a lot of people. Adele's got an amazing voice. I'd love to do something for Adele. That would be uh, quite. But it's not. It's. I guess it's not really crazily weird. Um, actually, it'd be really cool to do some rap stuff. I'm just trying to think. Name a name a great rapper. Can you oh, think of something? Oh, Eminem. Uh, yeah, Eminem. Yeah, it's a, something sort of like sort of you could do something a beautifully orchestral because I know he did years ago. He did something with um, Elton oh, John, wasn't it? When he did the uh, Elton John was playing the piano when he sang with him. I think was it the was it the Grammys? The, the Grammys and also that uh, with a with a female singer. Uh, white is it White Flag or? Um, oh, I know who you talk. It was uh. Oh, the, it's the, uh Dido, yeah. The Dido. please don't go and wonder why. Oh, that's a great yeah. song. That's a yeah. great song. Love it, exactly. love it. Something like that would be really cool, but with some really amazing sort of something, sort of sweeping symphonic stuff. I'd love to do that. We need to hook that up, man. We got a lot of rapper friends out there. If you're a rapper and we want to collab, let's uh, hook something up. Yeah. Man. Cool. Oh, it'd be epic. It'd be epic. We need, we need a budget for the for the, get the orchestra together. So <laughs> we get a lot of love for uh, Jason Becker. I guess he had ALS. Uh, oh yeah, I love Jason Becker. He's amazing. Uh, we ALS. Jason yeah. Becker went and saw him when he was very sick. He used to play with Diamond Dave after Vi. Okay. Um, oh gonna, yes. Yeah. Okay. We got a question from JB. He says, "What software do you use to compose on?" She, he says, uh, "Logic Ten, Logic X." Ten, yeah, um, I, I love using that. I, I find it really quick, and uh, sit at the piano sometimes if I don't want the pressure of a computer looking at me. So I will write there. Now you talked about this earlier when you were uh, said you went to LA, but where you've been to the states? Where have you been in the states? I've been to. I love New York so much. I love it. Um, New York, of course. Um, San Francisco. I've got an old school friend who lives there, and I love it. Been surfing up there with my boyfriend. Um, really love that. Went to Boston once, went to Tanglewood once when I was um, just kind of starting out and I met all these, um, I, I went with a, a presenter guy who took me to meet, um, I met Hans Zimmer, I met John Williams's, um, I didn't meet John Williams sadly, but I met his um, editor, Ken Womberg, um, and I gave him some scores. I remember I was like, do you want to hear and look at my scores? And I, was like, and I think he, he took them very politely. He was a very nice man. Um, and yeah, I met a few different composers. Oh, where else have I been? Oh, I've been to um, South Carolina. That was a trip. 
And I remember swimming there, there's amazing butterflies, all these monarch butterflies and dragonflies coming over, you know, just flying over the water. Oh, yeah. that, so that was that was amazing. Oh, and Jackson Hole, I went to there once. Wow. Jackson Hole, Wyoming, nice. I'm just, I've been to Wyoming for like maybe 20 minutes. I was in Colorado, or I was in Denver for work, and I, just, I was like, okay, since I'm over here, I got to drive up to Wyoming just to check it off the list. And man, Wyoming is... Uh, yeah. Is pretty, for somebody like you, actually, I would probably recommend Wyoming because there's like nobody lives there really because it's like it's kind of expensive and it's all oh, yes, I noticed it was quite mm, kind uh, of like, all up in the mountains. I mean, the Rocky Mountains are everywhere. I mean, there's uh probably like 600,000 people in Wyoming. Yeah, I got more people in Cleveland than there is in Wyoming, and it's a crazy big too. It's the uh, least populous state ever. It's a uh, it's a nice thing, though. I'd like to visit more of it. Yeah, they, I think uh, there's one is it Yo not Yosemite? What's the national park with the geyser? The one that always blows up. Old Faithful, I think. Yellow is that Yellowstone? I think yeah, that's in Wyoming. Yellowstone. Yeah, that's I loved all that. I haven't been to the parks actually. I really, really love to go. Um, that's a, a major thing. I did notice, yeah, the the Grand Tetons in um in Wyoming and you know Jackson Hole were just stunning. I remember going for a like a like a ride on it was sort of a, a little trail on horseback and there were just it's so beautiful it was get, just getting cold and the snows are about to come and there's they said oh i think we should go back now because something about bears and moose <laughs> talking about i don't know but uh it was it was quite an eye-opener i mean you've got so much uh, amazing countryside and different terrains there know? really is man even here in like cleveland like I'm, we got this place called the cleveland metro parks and it's probably five minutes away it's so beautiful and people always complain oh i got nothing to do i mean granted the weather isn't optimal all the time but man nature is right there you go, we, we, me and the kids, there's this place we call it. My last name is Varel, so I call it Varel Beach. And it's just a little tiny. You just walk down the, the one part of the, the forest and you walk over a little bit. It's not it's not hard to get to, but you can't get to it from the main road. But it's only like 10 minutes to walk to it. And it's just so secluded. And it's right there in nature. And it's just our little part of the world. It's great, man. I love nature. I really do. Yeah, it's so amazing, isn't it? It's, it's just, it elevates you somewhere else. I, I just think it's just, I think it affects us in a way, um, in a kind of, spiritual way um, i don't think we realize it um do, do you know what i mean i mean when you're yeah. when you're standing at the top of a mountain or looking at the sea or you're in the woods you, they have you know we have these negative ions that come off it you, you feel the energy of it oh yeah it's, it takes away all the all, yeah, the, you know, the corporate, all the negativity in the world and you're just like okay this place has been here for a million years before i'm here it's going to be here for a million years after i'm here all this little stuff I got going on is totally insignificant. You, you just become one with the world, man. It's really epic. I love it. I love it. Yeah, I love it. All right, we got a question from Weed Wars. He says, what are your thoughts on Meatloaf? And uh, his, obviously, rest in peace. But did you uh, like Meatloaf as an artist? Well, I was I was really warm to him. <laughs> I felt like he had this kind of sense of humor. And I mean, I don't obviously know him. I've, I just heard that he's a really good guy. And I'm really sad that he died. And I didn't really know much, really, of of his music apart from the the ones that everybody knows but um yeah what what is what do people think of meatloaf in the states you know meatloaf is uh he's one of those guys where it's like people like him he's a little bit ago i mean the songs were in the 70s that, that uh paradise by the dashboard light song they played that a lot like almost to the point where it was too much <laughs> like it was weird like in in uh i gotta tell you a story when we were in seventh grade i think in our seventh grade teacher we were teaching, learning like sex education or something, or something about romance. And she's like, "All right, we're gonna play." It. She played the Meatloaf video, "Paradise by the Dashboard Light," as like a uh, a lesson in how to, you know, dating and stuff. It was really wild because, like, if you go through the date, go through the song lyrics, you know, it's all about you know the guy Meatloaf asking a girl, "Okay, you know, can I kiss you? Can I do this? Not tonight, not tonight." And eventually, they fall in love, and that's how you're supposed to do it, kind of thing. So, Meatloaf was holds like a a heart, a sentimental place in a lot of people's hearts, and a lot of people yeah. like. And karaoke too is real popular. I mean, it used to be popular. It's not as popular as it was, but that was a real popular song because it's a duet. You know, if, if you got a couple that can sing a duet, you know, let me sleep on it, baby. So they go back and forth. So people, that's, people like that kind of stuff about me, Meatloaf for sure. Yeah, there's there's all sorts of amazing, you know, ways of singing, and I don't know, all all, all sorts of different artists in the world we can choose from. It's it's uh, and lucky we've got so much music that we can tap into. All right, here we got a question from JB. He says, how do you normally start on a composition? Do you hear the music first in your head and then put it down or just start playing and see where it goes? Both. Both. I mean, usually usually I hear it in my head. I hear, I hear it. I mean, I or just somebody might say something or I might hear a sound and it just 
gives me an idea. Even like you might laugh at this, but but there was a really cool rhythm that the that I think a spoon had probably got stuck in the dishwasher and it was making this really cool rhythm. <laughs> and I thought, hey, that's cool. That's got a really good groove to it. So I'll get that down. <laughs> So anyway, really, anyway, it happens. Um, just, just, yeah, my, a little tune, some lyrics, a poem might inspire me. I might write a poem and um, do it that way. Yeah, or bird song as well. You know, there's a this this guy Janacek who I told you about. This composer, he used to, he was very inspired by nature, and he would, he would be, uh, he'd write almost try and transcribe bird song, make it. Into right, now, what is the what is the World Land Trust, and how did you become an ambassador for it? Um, World Land Trust, are, you have to know about them because they're incredible. Uh, they're a small company, a charity that that really pack a massive punch because they they buy up land all around the world. Uh, a lot of rainforests, we're talking rainforests and other natural habitat that's endangered. They don't buy it themselves. They get partner organizations to buy it. So all the donations, uh, people, you know, donate to them and that land, they work with the, these people in South America, particularly, and all, all around the world. But South America, you might be looking at a, an acre of land costing a hundred pounds um, in South America, whereas that same land um, would cost maybe a thousand pounds in in India. So, so if you're going to save an elephant, they do things like they save. So you've got elephants that need are endangered, and there's all these different areas of um, people living there. They work out a way to get these elephants to walk between, they call them elephant corridors, so they can actually, uh, they're not trapped by civilization and they can they can be together and, and proliferate. Um, and so the money goes to that. Uh, and so that's what's so brilliant. And I'm that's what I do. I raise awareness with my music, just try and let people know what, what they're doing and where their money goes. Nice, yeah, it says that they funded over 2 million Acres of rainforest and other habitats over the world. So that's a nice chunk of uh, chunk Huge. of land. This yeah, is and also all that those animals get protected because the land's protected. So that's why I love it so much. And I don't know if you guys have heard of um, Sir David Attenborough. He's he's like he's a national treasure that we call him. And uh, you might know his his brother Richard Attenborough, who's a who was a film director, um, famous film director, and he's. He does a lot for na nature because he does he narrates these these famous nature documentaries and he's brilliant and all of that and he's their patron as well so um, he raises awareness for for the whole plight of animals and the environment. And that leads me to my next question about this Africa series you did for the BBC. Now, can you talk about this first off? This is this already aired this this series? Yeah, that this. Um, a, it's become a really famous series actually uh it, it just because i think it has so many amazing stories and and david attenborough was narrated it uh it was a six six part series that i did i think 2012 now um and it it just i think it caught uh people's attention because there's some stunning sequences there's a very sad baby elephant dying sequence and there's this amazing sequence of these two giraffes just kicking the whatever's out of each other <laughs> um and i had to write this you know a lot of music to all of it um so uh uh yeah it was an amazing amazing thing i love doing it yeah giraffes are one of the weirdest looking animals in the world it's like they have these giant long necks and I, they're so gentle too because there's a zoo a uh, zoo up here in cleveland obviously there's zoos in most cities but there's a place where you can like get a piece of cabbage or whatever and go up and feed the giraffe and you go up there and feed the giraffe man this giant giraffe tongue comes out and licks your hand and you're like whoa geez and this tongue is probably like, I mean, <laughs> his tongue is this long. <laughs> the biggest thing I've ever seen in my life. It is slurping your hand. You're like, ah, oh, geez. And they're just walking, walking around with these tall necks. And it's, uh, and they're a gorgeous animal. But how did, yeah. I mean, just think about how did, uh, you know, life design an animal? That yeah. Like, it's how such did a weird life design, you know, the, the greater, the greater God designed that creature somehow? I, I, it's amazing, isn't it? <laughs> well, they were designed to get all those high trees, weren't they? Right. Then did you was it? Were you, was this what you were uh, nominated for an Emmy for for this series? What were you nominated yeah. for an Emmy on? Yeah, it was it was uh, for best score. Um, and I mean that that sequence had a lot of interesting uh, operatic stuff with it, and a kind of Morricone style Wild West vibe, especially with those giraffes. But yeah, that that's that's one of the things I got nominated for, and um, it 
yeah, it, it had a huge, a huge airing in, in hundreds of, of countries. And uh, yeah, it's still just, it's still an epic series. I, I love it. And I, you know, it was a time of my life where for some reason it's captured people's attention and their hearts. I just think it's because the stories were so good. They were fun, fun stories that you you can relate to. Now, have you ever been to Africa? Uh, once, um, and really, I'd you know I'd like to go and visit more parts of Africa. I went in uh, three just before the pandemic. Actually, it would have been 2019, and I did um, something called Okavango um, River of Dreams. Was it River River of Dreams? Yeah, and it's all about the amazing species and wildlife there. And we went, we recorded the Johannesburg Film in, uh, Orchestra. And um, uh, I worked with another guy, Joe. Um, he he was the other composer. And he, yeah, he, he's actually from America. Okay. So he, yeah, we wrote that score together and he conducted the orchestra and it, great people. And I would have gone to the game reserves, but I wasn't really prepared. I just went there as a composer thinking, oh, we're just going to record the orchestra. And then I found out that the, the two people that were, were actually running the show and directing it, they also worked on game reserves and they worked, they owned a couple of game reserves and they said, oh, you, you should come up. And I was like, well, I, I don't have any mosquito repellent. <laughs> I don't have any shoes, um, but I will do sometime. So would you like to visit Africa? That's going to be my next question. Is there a certain place? Like, would you like want to visit one of those preserves in like Kenya and Tanzania? Yeah. I'd, that... love, I'd love to go to Kenya. I I have to say that um, I, I do, I, I'm not really lover of creepy crawlies. Um, and I know there's lots of them. I would love to go. I just like to make sure that I wasn't going to a get eaten by a lion because I've done because I've met so many film directors. I mean, this there's a single Lion Kingdom I did, and I remember the the guy who um, amazing amazing director. He lived out there on his own in with all these lions in the middle of nowhere, and he, I remember him telling me that he was coming back one day and his car broke down, um, his his jeep broke down, and he had to go through this pride of lions who was sitting there because he thought he wasn't going to sleep in his jeep all night um and he said it was the only time and he's very brave very rugged guy um and i remember him saying that he that was the one time he actually felt really quite scared of walking back through the dark through this pride of lions to get back the last bit to the camp the camp that he's only in on his own you know <laughs> so seems uh yeah so i'm slightly anxious about that <laughs> right, we got a question from JB and he is what third party VST instruments do you use in Logic Pro or do you mainly just use the ones already in Logic? Um I use a lot of different things. Um do you mean sample instruments? Um because I, yeah. I yeah, things like um let me think, give you some ideas uh, I might use. Um Aflatus strings are really good. Um, there's loads of them. There's, there's, there's lots of different things. Um, I, I'm always trying, you can never get the right, you can never get everything in one package, it seems. You know, I might have a cello from something else. Uh, guitars, uh, you know, I play a bit of guitar myself and then I'll replace them with with live instruments if I can, just get a friend in to play something or depending on, depending on the budget. But um, yeah, I, I use a whole load of different things. Um, East West Orchestra is still good after all these years. Uh, um, just trying to think, loads of stuff that I've got that I've kept for for years. Uh, I've absolutely kept for years because some of that stuff's still really brilliant. Um, Joshua Bell violin's quite cool. Just depending how you use it, really. Thank you. Now this video, Blackbird. I just yes. I watched it uh, over the, the past couple of days. It was filmed, I had to look up where it was filmed. This Cots, is it Cotswold Nature Preserve? Is that what it is? Yes, it's, a, it's there is. It was filmed partly um, by the River Severn, which is a beautiful river, and partly um, in the Cotswolds, um, a place called Western Burt Arboretum around that area. All right, now uh, the place is amazing. That was first off, what was the inspiration for this, uh, for this song? It was just you know, your typical, you know. You're just always in nature and you saw a bunch of blackbirds. Was there any Beatles inspiration for that? And what was uh what what made you like, okay, I need to write this song? What's uh what was the inspiration particularly for this song? Well, the inspiration, I suppose, it comes from childhood a bit because you know, um I well, first of all, I love the song of the blackbird. I absolutely love it. 
Um, I just see someone says they live near the River Seven there. <laughs> yeah, well, we got about five, five, five six yeah. people from the UK watching, so it's uh... Seven with an R, Severn. Um, and yeah, and I love the sound. So the song, I don't know if your Blackbirds are similar over there, but they've just got a most beautiful song and very melodious. And they're all sort of, you know, singing at dusk. And one of the memories I have as a kid is that I, I like a lot of kids, got, got a little bit frightened of the the dark. Um, I see Warwickshire. Um, I got frightened of the dark. And so I'd always just know when the blackbirds started singing really early in the morning that it wouldn't be dark anymore. So I, I it's kind of a metaphor for nature's divinity, if you like. There's it's the spiritual in nature. And that's why I love the blackbirds. So. Okay. And I really love the Beatles Blackbird song as well. Not that it's anything to do with that, but while we're on the subject of Blackbird. It's a good, it's a good melody, uh, the Beatles one is. Love the ping ping. Now, how uh, did you have to get like any kind of licensing to film all that there? Or just kind of just go up and film? How does stuff like that work? Um, well, I did. I mean, filming in, we were filming on an area that was not, um, that was not you know anybody around it was it was not in a place that was regulated at all we we, we just you know we we had to get on the get very quick to, to the river because of the summer setting and um so yeah there's, there's areas of the cotswolds that are you know very wild and um you could just sit under a tree and, and do and, and film without bothering anyone there's nobody around so yeah no, but some places you do have to get get permission I was just randomly thinking about birds. Now, when you were in the States, was there any bird? Do you, do you watch birds at all? I mean, you're big into nature. Do you like pay attention to the different types of birds that are out there? When you were in like in New York, did you go to Central Park at all and just check out some of the birds and just relax there? Yeah, yeah I, I love the I love the birds in, in the Central Park. I did actually see some documentary about was it some was it were they some eagles or doves or something that up on um what was that in, in Central Park? And well, somebody... I mean, Falcons are bald eagles. Falcons. Yeah, yeah. They yeah. Do that. That, that was a, that was amazing, and I mean, you know, I'm so glad that that it's like London. We've got Hyde Park. You know, you've you've got you know Central Park. It's just brilliant that you that we've got parks because all the green. It's just so healing. You know, it's like I think it's like the heart center, isn't it, of of a city having a park in it? It's, oh, every, it's, every big. I mean, in Cleveland, we have a place called uh, Public Square, and it's it's not. A, I mean, there's green space and parks here or there, mostly pigeons and statues. But you got to have in the heart of all that urban stuff. You always got to have some kind of you know nature oasis just to get away. It's crazy with Central Park. I was just there in August in New York when my daughter and me went out there for vacation, and uh, I mean, you could just go out there and just chill on a rock and just look around. It's just so serene, man. They got a yeah. they got a nature like inside the park. There's actually another little park inside the park where you can just, you know, it's all they don't have they have trees and everything. It's just like it was, you know, way back, you know, before the Dutch came over and everything else. And it was a uh, really cool man. There's squirrels walking around and little bird bass and stuff. And it's uh it's totally awesome. If you're ever in New York, definitely go to Central Park. Over any of it really. I mean, you can go visit, you know, Liberty Island and you know all the other stuff. I mean, I think Central Park's easily the best best thing about New York City. Yeah, it's lovely. I, I, that's where I'd love to live if I ever li lived in New York. All right, we got a question from Char. She says, do you know of the Beach Boys, Frank Sinatra, and what do you think of them? Sarah, I am from the UK near White City. Yay, UK. Um, love the Beach Boys. Um, Frank Sinatra, he's got a great voice. Uh, the Beach Boys particularly I love, I think. I don't know it's just the surfing associations, um, but... Um, Brian, uh, what's his other name? Wilson, Brian Wilson. Brian Wilson. I love Brian Wilson. And, you know, he just, that little surfer girl, it's really lovely. He was just so talented, just such a talented man, all of them. Oh, just, my mom you know, loved the, the Beach Boys. She loved, I grew up on Surf and Safari and, you know, Surfer Girl and all those songs, man. My mom, that was actually my first concert was uh, back in 1989. It was a baseball game. The Indians were playing somebody. And uh, it, like you pay an extra five bucks, you can stay after the show. And it was it was the Beach Boys band by then. Obviously, Dennis Wilson died before that, but it was it was actually yeah. my first uh, paid rock concert was the Beach Boys. That's wild. Oh, you're so lucky. I I just love to have seen them. Uh, oh, actually, ha hang on. There we there I am saying I'd love to have seen them. They did play. I think they played a festival, and I did see, I did see Brian Wilson play. 
he was singing. That's crazy. That was about a, a few years ago. I just I'm I'm imagining when you know seeing them when they were young, but but actually I did see them and it, they they sounded amazing. He still sounded really amazing. Everything that they, they had great musicians. That they were they were just so hot. The musicians amazing. Oh yeah, they came out even in the Kokomo was you know eighty seven eighty eight. That's still a great song. I mean even today even it was well after the you know their prime and stuff. Yeah. I love only oh only God knows why that's a great. Stuff one. USA, um, yeah. That might be their best one. I forgot. God only knows. Oh, it's such a beautiful song. God only knows. Yes, yes. God only yeah. knows. Like I got it confused with uh, Kid Rock because Kid Rock sings uh, "Only God Knows Why." And God only knows. It's, that was actually. Mm -hmm. God, I think that was my parents' wedding. No, no, the Queen was my parents' wedding song. You're my best friend. You're my best friend. Oh, I love that song. I love that song. My my wedding song was uh, well, the song I wanted was. Uh, we didn't really have a song song, but there's a song by Nirvana called Lithium. Dun, 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 I'm so happy because today that was my, I love that song. It's just uh yeah, uh, it's such yeah. a great uh great rager when you're out there dancing. It's bought perfect, man. Oh, so much amazing music out there. Outstanding. Now, is there do you have anything else to promote besides the new album? Talk in depth about the new album and how do people get a hold of you if they want to get a hold of you? Well, um, I'm on all the social media stuff. I've got a website, sarahclass.com, which actually is going to be changed soon, but it's it'll be up. Um, and yeah, all the all the usual channels, Facebook, uh, Instagram, and um, you know, you could always drop me a line on my website, which is just info at sarahclass.com and, and resonate, yes. Uh, that's the main main thing I'm you know looking at at the moment. My main love, it's always the last thing you did, isn't it? Oh yeah, oh, <laughs> yeah. Oh, uh, yeah, so yes. Yeah, so if you haven't checked out our album, it's on YouTube, all and Spotify, all that stuff. Check it out. It's a, I, that Blackbird song's amazing. You're gonna, I mean, you're gonna love. Uh, if, you, if you're not usually a classical fan, you're gonna like this. I mean, it's uh, it's really serene music. Especially if you know you're a pothead like me, you'll get really into it. <laughs> you know, like that. Yeah, man. So it's I not like classical. It's it's all sorts. Of, it's kind of like it's on the edges. So there's classical, but it's not hardcore classical, and it's there's a bit of singer songwriter there too. Thank you. Well, I'd like to appreciate and thank you for coming out and joining us today, Ms. Sarah Class. It was an honor talking to you, and we'll see you around, okay? Honor, honor talk to you, Joe. Thank you for all the lovely people who've, who've asked me questions, and thank you for having me on the show. All right, appreciate it. Thanks for coming out. We'll talk to you later. Thanks, Joe. All right, bye. Bye.